keep that in mind. Go to verse number 12. Hebrews 3, verse number 12. Take heed, brethren, lest there be any of you in an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. That's the title of my sermon today is Steadfast Unto the End. And listen, this is written to the church. He's talking about staying in fellowship with God, being faithful in our house. He's exhorting us to not depart. Right? He's saying that we should not depart because guess what? Some will depart. There are people that are in church that will fall out. There are people that have already fallen out of this church and they're doing something else. They're not going to church. They're not soul winning. I doubt they're reading their Bible. I doubt their prayer life is right. And listen, I want to exhort you while it is today to remain steadfast until the end. Remain faithful in your house. Your house isn't talking about the walls. Your house is talking about the people that you're responsible for. The souls that God has given you, you need to be steadfast unto the end. And it says here that they become hardened by sin and they end up falling out of the church. They become hardened by the leaven, the things they've let into their life, the priorities they put over the Word of God, and they get hardened in their heart. They get bitter toward God. They say, well, I'm not sure if I should keep doing what I'm doing, and they end up falling out, and they're not steadfast to the end. So how do we hold our confidence steadfast to the end as it's talking here? All right, listen, I'm going to tell you, the Christian life is not always easy. The Christian life is not a cakewalk. Hey, there are ups and downs. There are good days, right? But we will have trials. We will have tribulations that the devil will use to try to shake you loose. And look, God wants to use those opportunities to get you stronger in your faith, to get you your walk with Him stronger. Look at verse 13 again. But exhort one another daily while it is called today. Hey, Christian, it's your job to reach out to other people within the body and say, how are you doing? I want to encourage you. I want to challenge you to remain steadfast. How's your walk with God? How's your reading? I missed you in church. Right? It's, it's our job to encourage each other. Holding your finger here, turn ahead to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. We are commanded to encourage each other in this life. That is one of the responsibilities of Christ, the Christian life. I mean, it's fellowship. It's to exhort and encourage and challenge and provoke. Right? We've got to help each other. The world's not going to help you. Look, even in your family sometimes, it's, it's not easy to help each other. The devil wants to put something in between you and your wife. The devil wants to put something in between you and your children. Even if you have saved adult parents, you know, and now your parents, the devil wants to put things in between those relationships to try to cause you to fall out of church. The devil wants you to be weary in well-doing and cause you to fall out. Look at verse 23 in Hebrews chapter 10. Same commandment here, same thing. Look what he says. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. God made a promise. Our confidence is in him that he's going to get us through this. He wants to help us. He is faithful to his word, to his promises, that he'll give us life. Right? Look, the life is in the spirit. Sometimes we get wore out in the flesh. Sometimes we just feel like letting everybody know that we're tired, that we've had too much, this life is difficult, but you know what? Your true life is in the Spirit. How is it that regular flesh and bone men of God were able to walk for 40 days and 40 nights without food? How is it that somebody could fast for three days or seven days without food? How is that even possible except the Spirit of God gives you life? It's the Spirit of God that will invigorate you and charge you and give you motivation and keep you on fire for God. Look, if you don't have that, I don't care how much food you have, you're still going to be tired. I don't care how much coffee you have, right? The Baptist drug of choice is what I like to call it. I don't care how much coffee you have, you're going to get wore out. You're going to get discouraged. It's in the Spirit that we have to revive ourselves, that we have to encourage ourselves. And hey, we have to encourage others. We have to help each other. That's our job. Look at verse 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. 
provoke is a strong word. Provoke means like pick a fight. We're told not to provoke our children unto wrath, right? If somebody's, it says they provoked God. We just read about the provocation. They disobeyed God. They picked a fight with God and, and God punished them, right? If you go out and provoke somebody, it's like putting your finger in their chest. Hey, buddy, what are you doing, right? Well, here he's saying, as a Christian in the church, it's your job to provoke each other unto love and to good works. Now, how do I provoke you to love? By being loving, right? You're going to mirror what I show you, right? Look, if, if everybody around you is mad all the time, it's probably because you're mad. If everybody around you has a bad attitude all the time, it's probably because you have a bad attitude. If your children are fussy, it's probably because you're fussy. If your wife is angry, it's probably because you're angry. When there's a problem around you, you notice in everybody, it's time to look in the mirror. It's time to say, wait a minute, hold up, what's going on? Look, how do you provoke love out of your Christian brethren and sisters? By being loving unto them. How do you do that? He says, and to love and to good works. Look at the next verse. Not forsaking the assembling. Not forsaking the assembling. The word church simply means congregation. Uh, we, this, is not, this is not the church. This is a wall. This is a building. Okay? This is the church. You people are the church. You are the congregation. You are the assembly. This is what Christ died for. This is where God will raise up leaders. This is where God's Holy Spirit works. And this is where to provoke each other unto love and to good works. Right? Staying in church. We're fighting this fight together. We're fighting the, the powers of darkness of this world. We're doing it as a team. And we have to help each other. We're on the same side. we got to love each other. How do we show that love? Right here. It starts with me showing the love to you. Then you turn around and show some love to your wife. And then your wife shows it to your children. And right on down the line. And then this afternoon, we're going to go to a stranger. And we're going to show them some love. We're going to say, I've been praying all week to get somebody saved. And now you've opened your door. I hope it's you. Right? We're supposed to provoke each other unto love and to good works. And hey, the good works, number one, is to stay in church. But obviously, that would include the commandments. You want to keep the commandments. You should challenge each other to obey God's word. You know, and oftentimes we will confide in one another, hey, pray for me, I'm struggling with this or that. You know, and don't use that as a club. Don't go and whisper to somebody else, oh, you know, brother, so, no. Use that to sincerely pray and intercede for your friends and say, God, help this person get over this. God, help me to be forgiving. Help them to be forgiven. Lord, be long-suffering and merciful. Give them the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome their problems. And then provoke them to love. Hey, how are you doing on that? Hey, are you growing? Are you moving forward with that problem you've got? What can I do to help you? I'm praying, but what else can I do? We're to provoke unto love and to good works. Look, let's finish this verse in 25. He says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. As the manner of some is, hey, there are people that you know that may come to mind that are not in this church right now. Man, I'm praying for them. I don't know what's going on in their life. I don't know why they're here, but it breaks my heart. Because I know they're not in a Bible preaching church. I know they're not reading the Word of God. I know they're not out soul winning. I know there isn't spiritual growth with their children. Where are they? Man, they need to get that figured out. They need to, to be willing to fight that battle, stay in this life, get on fire for God, and do what's right. And we need to pray for each other, provoking them unto love and good works. It says, exhorting one another. That's building somebody up. How have you been? I've missed you. I love you. I'm praying for you. How's your spiritual growth? What did you read this week? Hey, look, let me share something I read. You know, it's easy to go up and say, did you read your Bible this week? But that's wrong, right? What should we do? What's the, what would be the right way to exhort one another into reading the Bible? Hey, brother, can I share something with you I read this week? Check this out. This is a cool verse. I don't know what it all means, but it applied to me in this way, and maybe you can get something out of it. And then your brother will say, uh, I don't have anything to show you, right? Uh-oh. Busted, right? Well, maybe next week they'll come back to you with one. Hey, you know, you really provoked me. That verse you shared with me meant something. And now, you know, I got me back on track of my Bible reading, right? We need to talk about the things of God, and we need to do it out of a spirit of love. Not to embarrass one another where they're, where they're coming short, but to lift your brother up. Look, there's a saying I've heard my whole life. My dad said it every, all the time. Every time I hang out with different friends, he would say, listen, people do one of two things. They either drag you down to their level, or they pull you up to your level. And I always took that as to saying, well, Dad, I know my, my friends are lame, but I'm pulling them up to my level. He's saying, you need to get some friends that will pull you up when you're down. And listen, you can't always be the person that's pulling everybody else up. Eventually, they're going to weigh you down. 
they're going to pull you down. You need to find some brothers and sisters that are willing to lift you up in your time of need. This is how the church works. This is how a healthy congregation is. We help each other in a time of need. We encourage each other when we're down. Go back to Hebrews 3. Go back to Hebrews chapter 3. Hey, think about it. God wants you to be like a motivational speaker. Has anybody ever listened to a motivational speaker? Get you all pepped up and do the right thing and get your mind together, get your life together, get your finances together, right? Well, here God is saying we're to exhort one another or to provoke one another unto love and to good works. God wants you to be a motivational speaker inside the congregation to your brothers and sisters. God wants you to motivate fellow Christians to get on fire for Him and do the things that will help them grow spiritually. God has tasked you with this. He's commanded us. He wants us to encourage our brothers and sisters to stay in this life, to stay in the Christian walk. You think about it, you see like those stickers on the back of the truck, beach life, sand life, you know, all that. Hey, well, how about, how about Christian life? Just Christian life. What does that mean? What does that entail? There's a bunch of fake Christians out there. They don't believe the Bible. They don't believe Jesus is God. They're all mixed up. They're Christian in name only. But hey, you found the truth. You're in a good church. You've got a good congregation of people here. Man, I love this church. I love you people. I look forward to coming to church and seeing the faces mostly smiling faces. You need to work on that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but look, we're here to help each other. We're here to lift each other up. And we're really provoking each other to not return to the filth. Don't go back to that walk you were in before. Don't go back to those friends that were always negative and dragging you down. Go, don't go back to the desires of the flesh that kept you from serving God. Man, we need to stay focused and get on track. And, and one of the best ways that God sees fit for us to do that is for us to motivate each other. It's for us to pick up the phone or, hey, you know, shoot a text message, right? How you doing? Been thinking about you. You know, you think about my, and my phone, I can schedule a text message. This is the best thing I've ever discovered. Man, at, at midnight, when I'm thinking about you, I'm going to schedule a text message for you in the morning. So if you get one at 8 o'clock, you know, I don't know, I may not be awake, but I sent it while I was up, while I was working, you know what I mean? You think about it, it's good you can do that, because sometimes in the middle of the night, you know, you're, you're praying. If you can't sleep, that's what I recommend, just pray. Pray for the folks in this church. Walk around this church and pray for the faces and the people. And you know what? Send some text messages. I love you. I've been thinking about you. I'm praying for you. How's your growth? There's a guy in, in Fort Worth that sends me text messages all the time. It always hits me when I need it. I don't know how he plans it. I don't know if he schedules them or if the Lord just leads it. But I mean, it, every time I get a message from this guy, I'm halfway to a frown. And I, oh, man, sometimes I don't even know what to say. Sometimes I don't even have a response for the guy. Sometimes I don't even answer. I'm just like, thank you. Thank you for sending people to help encourage me. We all need that. We all need to do it. The only way it's going to happen in here is if you say, all right, I'll do it. I'll volunteer. I'll help somebody. There's somebody in here that I can text and just say, keep on keeping on. Keep on living for God. Keep on smiling. God has given us power over the grave. He's given us power to redeem souls, to forgive sins through the gospel. And, and now we need to go out and do something about it. You know, one of my most favorite Proverbs is Proverbs 18.21. It says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You have the power to speak life or death into people's lives. If you are speaking blessings to people, I mean, that will flourish. There will be fruit from that. You're going to love what comes back from that. But guess what? If you're a negative Nancy all the time, Eeyore, oh man, life is rough. Well, you're going to reap the fruit of that. You're going to eat the fruit of that bitter tree when you're speaking death. When you're always looking for what's wrong, it's going to come back and bite you. And it's going to hurt you and everyone else you love. And it's not your job in the church to drag Christians down. It's your job to lift them up. It's your job to say, hey, I love you. How you been? I've been thinking about you. I'm praying for you. You know, and a lot of times when you have your own woes in life, the best thing I can recommend to you is to pray for someone else. Do a selfless act of praying for a brother or sister, and God will lift up your spirit. God will pull you up where you can't on your own when you're willing to pull somebody else up. Look, you're back in Hebrews chapter 3. Look, we have the power to speak life to others to help keep them in church. Look at, look at verse 13. But exhort one another daily. Now, that does not say every other day. 
That does not say weekly. That does not say monthly. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. That means when you think about it, do it. Don't waste any time. That's why I say schedule a text message. If it's 9 o'clock at night and you're not sure they're awake, schedule it for tomorrow. Do it. Lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold on to the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. This is not saying if you don't stay confident, you're not saved. This is saying to the church, now that you are saved, the only way you're going to stay in the body of Christ, in the congregation, is if you remain confident. You keep that joy. You stay faithful in your house. You stay on fire for God. And the best way to do that is to start motivating other people. The more you motivate other people to do things, the more you'll be motivated by your own words. Right? When you have a bad moment and no one else is around, you're going to remember what you said to somebody else. Hey, it's okay. Life goes on. God loves you. God's giving you victory. You'll get through this. And you see your friends get through it. And then when you're down, you don't think of those things. You don't remember those things. And it's good to have a, a something to remember. It's good to have you know, points in your life you can look back to and say, I remember that victory. That was great. I remember what God has done for me, what he's delivered me from. Look at verse 15. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. So here they provoked God, and God is saying, remain steadfast unto the end of your Christian walk. Listen, that's the goal. Hey, the Christian life is not easy. It's not always going to be fun. You're going to have hard days, but God loves you. God's given you victory, but it starts with you. You are the only one that can change it. There is power of death and life in your tongue. And while it is today, hear His voice. Don't listen to your own voice. Don't listen to the whisper of the devil in your ear. Oh man, that ain't right. This ain't right. Things ain't going. Hey, listen to His voice today and stay steadfast forever. Look, I want you guys to turn to John chapter 10. John chapter number 10. He's telling us here how to keep our hearts steadfast to the end, how to make sure that your family stays in this Christian walk. We got to hear his voice. How, well, what is his voice? How do, we, how do we hear his voice? What is the voice of the shepherd? It's the Bible. This is the standard. If there's somebody saying, man, you just don't know what's going on in my life. I've got it rough. This, my, my, my kids aren't right. My, my wife ain't right. My job ain't right. I'm going to say, how's your Bible reading? How's your Bible reading? Right? Somebody recently, I heard them saying that it's, they, they can never find time to get anything done. And when they think about just reading for, you know, half an hour or even, you know, if you read the Bible 15 minutes a day, you'll finish it in one year. And they say, I can't even find 15 minutes. You have no idea how clustered and frustrated and just how my life is. But yeah, but, but those days that you start out and you say, I'm going to take 15 minutes first. I'm going to carve out and I'm going to make this the priority of my life. I'm going to give the first hour of my life today to God. Guess what? God will change your schedule. He'll change the time. He'll fix things for you. You'll be more on track. You'll be more efficient at what you do. When you walk in the Spirit and you start your day that way, God will help you fulfill everything else. God will make sure you get everything else done. And, and, and too many times we look in the other direction. Well, I just don't have time. By the time I get to the end of the day, you, well, you should have seen my day. Hey, how did your day start? If you're frustrated, you're wore out, you're, you're having a hard time staying encouraged, how did your day start? Well, you don't know. I mean, I, I, I was up late. I was working. How, yeah, but how did it start? Because if it started right, I guarantee it will end much better. Look here in John chapter 10. Look at verse number 1. The Bible is our standard of life. Look at verse number 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheephold, sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. The sheep hear his voice. If you're saved, you can hear the voice of the shepherd. You know the Word of God when you hear it. And I, Look, it's not the NIV. It's not the New King James. These funny Bibles are so ridiculous. He says they climb up some other way, some other way. If you're ever listening to a, a video or some other preacher and you hear somebody reading from a funny Bible version, 
it becomes evident real quick. You're like, whoa, that's not the voice of the shepherd. Why does this sound weird? Why is it? Why are things backwards? Why are things missing? Right? The the, the sermon we did on the the ESV version, how they literally make verses contradict themselves according to the original manuscript, according to the King James Bible, according to every other Bible, even the wrong Bible versions, that Bible's so wrong. Why does it sound weird? Because it's not the voice of the shepherd. That's some other way, right? It's like the back door. Look, he's talking about somebody climbing in uh, some other way. We traveled up from Orlando last night. When I got home, I went through the fence. I went around. I busted out a window. I climbed in the bathroom window. No, that's breaking in. That's coming in some other way. I took my keys, I went in the front door, right? God has given us access, God has given us front door access to His Word, to His voice, to His standard, to the cure for everything that ails you. It's right here, we have to listen to the voice. Look at verse 4. And when He putteth forth His own sheep, He goeth forth, He go before them, and the sheep follow Him, for they know His voice. Right? If you've ever heard another version, you're like, that's weird. Something's missing. Something's wrong. You'll know it. If you read your Bible, you'll recognize other ones that are wrong. And listen, there are, there are babes in Christ that, are, that have not read their Bible as much as, as others, and they may not recognize it. They may not see it. But God's Spirit's going to lead you into truth. And when something is fake, He's going to help you recognize it. But the question is, now that you have the voice of God in your hand, you're looking at the pages in black and white right now, are you following the voice? You have the voice of God in your hand. You have the living words of the one true God. Are you obeying what you read? Are you learning the word and obeying it? Are you applying it to your life? You know, it's funny, in Orlando, Pastor Tommy McMurtry made this statement that I thought was just brilliant. He said, when, when people look at my wife and scoff and ask her, well, why are you wearing a dress? He, he has instructed her to no, no longer say, well, it's because I'm a Christian and I obey the Bible, right? Because the Bible says that a woman should not wear that which pertaineth unto a man, right? It's, it's called cross-dressing. It's an abomination, right? He says, I've told her just to say, because I'm a woman. Why does your wife wear a dress? Because she's a woman. If I ask Brother Dale, why do you wear pants? Would he say, oh, because I'm a Christian? No, he's going to say, because I'm a man, you know. Men wear pants. Figure it out, right? <laughs> Why does your woman wear a dress? Because she's a lady. She's a lady, unlike some of the women in this world. That's the standard. God has a standard. God wants women to stay at home. God wants women to wait, raise children. God wants men to go to work. He says, man, if you don't go to work, you're worse than an infidel. If you're a lazy dad and you're not taking care of business like you ought to, he says, you're worse than an unsaved heathen. It's wicked. We shouldn't do that. What about the TV? Uh-oh. Oh, don't go there, brother. For not the TV again. Leave that. Hey, kick that dead horse, right? <laughs> Listen, the Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. Those that have turned aside from the work of God, from obeying God's commandments, they're, it, the holly weird, right? All these perverts that work in Hollywood, and they portray other people, they act in some spirit, and they want to deceive you and your family into doing something other than what God has instructed you. The Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I don't care if you're watching the news or the history channel, there's some wicked stuff that they portray. Oh, God's not real, but aliens are. Aliens built the pyramid. What? This is the history channel? What kind of history is this? What in the world? I mean, it's bizarro world when you turn on TV. It affects your heart. Even the news, even the sports channel, even the sports news is going to have perversion nakedness, right? Bad jokes, per, uh, uh, advertisements for drunkenness, yep. right? Greed, covetousness, they're just pumping down your throat, putting it in your eyes. And guess what? Some of these things that go in your eyes will always be there. There are images from movies, from films that I saw even when I was a child that I'll always remember. There are certain things you see something and it triggers something. There are Star Wars, E.T., so, and I'm going way back, right? I'm old, okay? You go back to some of these old movies and it's like it triggers a memory as if it's my own memory that I thought, dreamed, or experienced. And it's in my brain as if it belongs to me. But guess what? They created it. They had an agenda behind it. They had a purpose and the goal was to get me to turn aside just as they have. The Bible says, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. And listen, men, especially men that work around other men, 
There comes a time when you need to be man enough to stop your ears from the filthy jokes, from the filthy conversation, from the, oh, look at that. No, I don't want to look at that. That's not right. Men, be man enough to, to just stop, say, hey, no, I'm not looking, I'm not taking part. Or how about when you're talking to an old buddy and he wants to say a word that you don't want to say anymore, hang up on him. Just hang up. And he calls you back. Well, we got disconnected. What happened? Well, you know what? You started using filthy language. And I like talking to you, but I don't want to hear that. It goes in my ear, in my brain, down in my heart, and it's going to come back out of my mouth. I don't want it coming out of my mouth. I got to put a stop to it. I'm taking a stand. Are you serious? Are you really going to hang up again? <laughs> okay, okay. I'm sorry. Cool. Now that we've established that, the next time you call me, I don't have to say a word. You know better. Oh, all of a sudden, you can, you're able to manage that and keep it quiet, whereas before, you, oh, but come on, everybody, hey, I don't care if everybody does it, I'm not going to do it, I don't want to hear it. Look, we've got to keep these things out of our life. In Acts 22, he says, The God of our fathers hath chosen thee, that thou shouldest know his will, and to see the just one, that thou shouldest hear the voice of his mouth. He says, God wants you to know his will. God wants you to know the just one, Jesus Christ, and hear the voice of his mouth. What's the voice of Jesus' mouth? It's called the word of God. It's called the Bible. He wants you to know his will. The only way you're going to find it is from the voice of God, the word of God. And if you're not opening your Bible, you will not be steadfast to the end. One of the only ways, and listen, I only got three basic little points today. The first one is to open your Bible, and you will be steadfast to the end. If you are not reading your Bible, you will get discouraged. You will get out of this life, out of this fight. And the rest of the team is going to be sitting here saying, where did so-and-so go? Where are they at? I miss them. Have you heard from so-and-so? We sure do miss them on the team. we got a place here for them. they still got a place in my heart. They're still on my, on my prayer list. Where are they at? I don't know. They left the team. They left this life. They got discouraged. They got, over, they got overwhelmed. Why? Because they're not listening to this voice they're listening to somebody else. Remember he says, the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Look at verse number five. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. They know not the voice of strangers. If somebody comes up and says, hey, don't go to church anymore. Hey, get out of here. What are you talking about? You know, it's funny how many times I come back and from the, the afternoon soul winning and there's a track right here on the pulpit. Some, some invitation to some funny church and on the back of it it says, you have to completely stop sinning to go to heaven. Psh, that's a lie. Who's doing that? Who's, who's willing to say you've stopped sinning in here? Raise your hand. You? Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> she's messing with, she's just getting her hair. All right, all right. But it's funny because people know when it's not the voice of, of the shepherd. They know when it's the voice of a stranger. Right? They bring me these tracks. Look at this church. Look at their lie. Look at the voice of this false prophet trying to tell you that, that you have to be perfect. God knows we can't be perfect. Right? The voice of the Lord, the Bible tells you something different. And there are strangers that are trying to pull you out of this fight. And yeah, it's easy to point at the television. How about the fake churches? How about the easy to please, easy listening music, smooth words preaching, right? How about those skinny jeans wearing? Slick hair, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you know, look, God's words are pure words. We need them to stay in this fight. If you're not listening to the voice of the shepherd, you will not be steadfast forever. If you're listening to the voice of a stranger, they will pull you off track. They will cause you to turn aside. You listen to some guy on the radio and I mean, he, he was talking about the Bible. He sounded close, but something was wrong. Yeah, voice of a stranger. There's something wrong there. Well, I, I talked to some guy at the door, and he claimed to be a Christian. He said he believed in faith alone, but he's reading out of an NIV. He goes to a Methodist church. Guess what? He's following the voice of a stranger. Listen up. This is very important because we talk to a lot of people. We talk to a lot of people throughout the work, preaching the gospel to them, evangelizing them, inviting them to church, provoking them unto good works, come to church, get involved, get on fire for God. And there's a lot of people that are listening to strangers. Listen, strangers are false prophets. There are some people that are sort of caught up and just following, you know, going in the wrong direction, that if they're saved, they'll figure it out. 
But when somebody tells you, oh, no, no, I, I mean, my NIV is perfect. I like it. And, and, and I think Paul Washer is a good preacher. And I got, the, I got the John MacArthur Bible. Listen, beware. They're listening to a stranger. They're not listening to the voice of the shepherd. When you present somebody with the Word of God, if you have somebody that's a Christian, they say, well, I don't, I don't believe in the, in the literal creation. I don't believe in a young earth. You say, well, let me show you from the Bible. And they say, well, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe that. I believe in evolution. Well, guess what? You've believed the voice of a stranger. They're probably not saved. Somebody that will not receive the Word of God, that will not hearken to the Word of God, they say, I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's right. Red flag. Hello, that's a, that's a stranger. This is very important. There are people that, you know, how, how can we figure out if somebody is saved or not saved? The Bible says, by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you'll be condemned. Right. Well, when the words that come out of your mouth are the words of the voice of the shepherd, I know you're saved. Yeah. When the words that come out of your mouth are the words of some false prophet reprobate, I'm a little worried. Yeah. Right. I don't care if you, why, well, I believe in grace and evolution. Well, guess what? You're probably not saved. Right. Look. There are young Christians that don't have all their doctrine figured out. Thank God, true Christianity is not about having all your doctrine figured out, because none of us would be saved. Okay? It's believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's faith alone for salvation. It's once saved, always saved. If you're not eternally secure, you're not secure at all. Once you have that foundation, you begin to build your house. You build the walls. You build the roof. And you build it through the Word of God. You build it through the voice of the shepherd. And without that, it's a stranger. So, so consider that as you speak to people. Be confident that you can be steadfast to the end in your Christian life if you will hear his voice. If you have somebody close to you, a family member, and you're not sure they're saved, and they, oh, I believe in faith alone, and I have a Bible, but I don't believe everything in the Bible. Red flag. They're not hearing the voice of the shepherd. This is a big deal. God gave us his word in his voice so we would not be lost, so that we would know where to go. Listen, the voice of the strangers is fake Bibles, unsaved family, false prophets, false churches, radio, televangelists, like all these people, you know, they, they fall in that category and they want to wear you out. They want to tell you to do the impossible. You have to stop sinning to be a Christian. Look, you ought to stop sinning so God doesn't curse your life. All right. If you obey God's commandment, He will bless your life. That's a promise that God makes. And I, hey, God promises it. I'm going to tell you, it's a promise. You want to have a better life? Just obey Him. Yeah. Just do what He said. That's where it starts. That's how you get there. And a lot of times we get, we get tired. We get wore out in the Christian life. We get beat down by the world. And it's difficult to, to keep going soul winning, to, to keep going to church, to, to be steadfast until the end. There are Christians that are not steadfast to the end. There are saved, born-again, Bible-believing Christians that will not remain steadfast to the end. They're going to fall out. They're going to go back to liberalism. They're going to go back to the world. They're going to go back to their other ways. And they're going to forsake God's Word, and that's not good. God will punish that. God will take the blessing off their life. And listen, we have to make sure we're not listening to the voice of strangers because they want you to fall out of church. They want you to stop reading your Bible. And you know... Just look around. I mean, to be a godly mother, that's not easy. To be a godly mother, it's difficult. It's a hard job. But I, I believe a, a godly mother is the most important job that any woman could ever have in her life. Raising children in the fear and admonition of the Lord to learn that God has given us His Word, God has given us salvation, that is the most rewardable, honorable thing a woman can do. Amen. And it's difficult at times. It's easy to do it the world's way. In this microwave generation we live in, it's easy to just throw your kids to the dogs and say, go watch some TV, leave me alone. But God wants you to do something different. He's given you the power and the ability through His Holy Spirit. And look, moms, you are very important. Dad cannot do his part without a godly mom. Dad cannot accomplish what he has to do without a godly mom backing him up. It takes two. That, that ha it works together. They lean on each other. And moms, you've got to read the Word. You've got to stay in church. Mom, if you are not reading your Bible, you're failing at being a mom. Even though they're fed and they've got clothes and they're learning today, you're failing at encouraging your own spirit and obeying the Word of God. You've got to listen to the voice of your Savior. Dads, you know, we're, we're commanded to work. The Bible says not to be weary in well-doing. 
Dad, sometimes you're like, man, I just feel beat down. I work six days a week. I'm working 12 hours. Or maybe it's, maybe it's less hours but more strain, more stress of management and people and things like that. Hey, be thankful you have a family that you can work for and provide for. Be thankful you have somebody that's dependent on you that can look up to you and just keep on keeping on. Do what's right even when it's hard. And I know dads, a lot of times you probably feel like you're being pulled in 15 directions. Well, I got to help so-and-so. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to take care of the work and family and home and, and soul. And hey, it's okay. God's given you the power to keep it all together. And God has given you kids and, and a wife. It's worth it all to stay in the fight. Dad, I don't care how weary you get. Stay in this fight. Do not give up. Now look, you're in John 10. Look at verse number 16. Verse 16, it says, And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. This is Jesus saying, listen, salvation isn't just of one nation. Salvation is of every nation. I have people in other nations you don't even know about that are going to be saved, right? Hey, you've got children that will be saved one day if you stay faithful, stay in the Word of God, and keep encouraging yourself. They shall hear my voice, he says here. They shall. They haven't yet. They will. How do they get there? Through you. How do you stay steadfast to the end? You've got to listen to the voice. He's given the words of, we've got to listen to the voice. It's that simple. How do you stay steadfast? Listen to the word of God. You've got to read it for yourself. You know, in, I've been talking with several friends recently and listened to a couple good preachers recently talk about similar things. Pastor Major and Brother Matthew Stuckey have said similar things. You know, what is, what is the secret to discipleship? Because listen, as, as leaders, mom or dad, your goal is to lead your children in that path, right? That's your first disciple. But as a soul winner, what's the secret to discipleship also? Guess what? It's the same answer. You have to find your first love. You guys remember in Revelation where it talks about the church that lost its first love. They stopped doing the first works. They quit going out soul winning, right? Jesus, when, when he started finding his disciples, one disciple finds him. The first thing he does is he goes and finds his brother. When my brother got saved, the first thing he did was he came and he told me. And I got saved. Listen, discipleship starts immediately. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Hey, now that you're saved, you've got to get in church, you've got to get baptized, and uh, what are you doing right now? Come on, let's go talk to your neighbor. What? Are you serious? Yeah, come on, let's go knock on their door and get them saved. Are you serious? You want to know the secret to discipleship? Be have them become a soul winner. Have them get on fire and see the power of the gospel. Let them hear you give the voice of the shepherd and watch people respond to it. Well, I don't know. I mean, my neighbor and I don't get along. Okay, all right, let's just go around the corner. We'll go to the next street. Let's do it. Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. Let's find your first love. It's time you fall in love for the first time and watch somebody get saved by preaching the gospel. Listen, that is the secret to discipleship. It's having others become soul winners. If you can do that, then you've got something there. That's the whole purpose. That's why, I mean, that's why we teach our family to follow God. That's why we, we teach our converts to find our first love. It's not just reading the Bible. It's watching the power of the Word of God in action. Then they'll fall in love. Because you know what? There are false prophets. There are unsaved family members. Hey, there are even ungodly Christians that will try to pull you out of church, pull you out of this fight, get you to stop soul winning. Well, you're never available on Saturday. We want to go down to the casino. Why don't you come with us? It's a Saturday. No. <laughs> come on, just go to the movies with us tonight. No. I'm a soul winner. I'm on fire for God. My first love is the Word of God. I have to hear His voice so I can tell you what it says so I can get others on fire. That's where the investment of your time ought to be. Look at verse 26 in this chapter. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You want to know the secret to staying in church? Follow me. Listen to this voice. You know what his voice is. You've identified the voice of the shepherd, of your God, your creator, your savior. Now open it up. Listen to it. Do something about it. Make it a priority. Fifteen minutes a day, and you've read this through in one year. Multiply that. 
Four, right? What's four times 15? No math whizzes in here. <laughs> read the Bible for an hour a day, and you've read it four times a year. An hour a day, four times in a year. Now, if you read the Bible four times a year, do you think you would be a more wise person than you were the year before? Do you think you'd be more steadfast than you were the year before? Do you think you'd be more blessed of God and have his, the power of His Spirit on your life? How about just 15 minutes a day? Man, how about just five? If you're not doing five minutes a day, there's something wrong. Look in the mirror, get it right. God's giving you the words of life, and when, you're, when your life is falling apart and you feel like there's just death upon you, maybe it's because you need the words of life in there. Even five minutes, can go back to Hebrews chapter four, where we're, actually go to Hebrews four, I think you were in three before. Like, I want to encourage you to stay in this fight. I want to encourage you to stay in church. I want to encourage you to stay with your family. Stay on fire for God, and it starts with the Word of God. In John 18, he said, Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. If you are of the truth, Jesus says, you will hear my voice. Others will refuse the Word of God. They're probably not saved. You know the Word of God. You're receiving it, so stay with it. Stay in this fight. Keep the blessing on your life. Like I said, I've got three very simple points today, and I'm almost done. How to stay steadfast to the end of your life? Number one, read the Word of God. Number two, stay in church. Number three, sing unto the Lord. Sing His praises, which you can pray and sing. It's all, it's all kind of the same. But you're in Hebrews 4. I want you to see this. Verse number three, For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Right? God says once you believe, it's like you're resting from your works. Whew, that was hard to get saved. What did you have to do? Just believe. That's rest. Right? You say, Boy, Brother Fan, I am wore out. I'm weary. I haven't had a full night's sleep. Well, you need some spiritual rest, right? It starts with faith. And that's where the life comes from is through the, the Spirit of God, the Word of God. Look at verse number 6. A warning here, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. He's saying there are others, they've heard the word of God, they had a chance, they didn't believe that promise was for them. Look, there are Christians that have fallen out of church because they say, well, those promises of blessing and family, that's not for me. That must be for somebody else. Man, get a hold of the promises of God. Christian, you know the voice of the shepherd, listen to it, take hold of it, believe those promises. There are people that are unsaved because they didn't believe. There are people that are saved and under the curse because they don't believe. They haven't believed everything. They haven't believed the report. They're not reading the Word of God. They don't know what God has in store for them. Look at verse 7. He says, again, he limiteth a certain day, saying in David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice... Harden not your hearts. Listen to me. You say, I'm wore out. This Christian life's getting me. Look, I'm not sure if I can stay steadfast to the end. Today, if you will hear His voice, harden not your hearts. The decision is yours right now. Will you open the Bible? Will you make Him the priority and trust Him to make you happy when you can? Will you trust Him to give you true joy in life? Will you trust Him to help you get through the hard times? Harden not your heart. Look, don't... Don't get a bad attitude. Don't harden your heart. Don't stiffen your neck. God wants you to be blessed and have great things, but it starts with a little of believing the promises. If you're not reading the promises, you can't believe the promises. You've got to open the Bible. Open your eyes. Look at verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. You wore out, there's a rest. Look at verse 12. For the word of God is quick. That means alive. You heard of the quick and the dead, yeah. right? Quick means alive. The life that we have in our Christian life starts with His voice. It starts with the Word of God. It says it is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible is saying that as a human being in my flesh, I can barely tell the difference between my soul and my spirit, but the Word of God can, right? Through the Word of God, I can discern the difference. He's also saying that the Word of God is living and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. God's Bible, when you read it, will show you your own thoughts. 
He's showing you that God knows how, who you are, what you are, what you do, and what you're thinking. He says, I already knew that. You're not the first one to be like. You're not the first one to go through this. You think you're the only one? We all have different trials and tribulations. God wants to use those as victory stories. Can you imagine just retreating? God's got this great victory story for you to share with somebody else, and instead you retreat. You give up. You fail. That's supposed to be something you can write on the calendar. Today I had victory over this, and the day before you gave up. It's your choice, Christian. You got to have the power of the word in your life. It is the word, it's the discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It can show you your own thoughts. I want you to turn to Psalm 95. Psalm chapter 95. Because here, remember we said David. He said in a certain day, saying in David. What he's talking about is in the Psalms. It's Psalm 95 that he's referencing. We're going to look at it. He says here, we should judge our own thoughts by the Word of God. Right? If the Word of God is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, he's saying use the Word of God to judge your thoughts. The problem is the world does vice versa. They use their thoughts and they judge the Word of God. Right? What's the voice of the shepherd? Well, I know the Bible couldn't be true because, what? Fill in the blank. Well, I saw a fossil one time that disproves evolution, you know, disproves the creation model. No, it doesn't. In fact, it proves it. But if you're so full that you've decided to blind yourself and say, well, we randomly came from nothing and it rained on a rock and that rock turned into a snail and it became a fish and the fish became a monkey. Hey, where's Mrs. Monkey? You know, there's, there's all these things missing in the evolution, right? But people have faith on that. They use their own thoughts and they judge the Bible. But here the Bible is saying, use this as your standard to judge your thoughts. Right? You have an imagination that's against, against God. You should cast it down is what it says. Well, how do I know it's against God? How do I know how to cast it down? The Word of God. This is the standard. You've got to get this in your mind and in your heart. That's how we judge ourselves. You got to read the word and the word says go to church, right? My third point is get a new song in your heart. Get a new song in your heart. If you got the old worldly song still in your heart, get it out as fast as possible. I've met people that they have such a such a distorted conscience, they can't have a quiet moment in their life. They got to have a TV on in every room or a radio on just to silence the devils, right? Hey, praise the Lord, we don't have that problem. You can't be possessed with the devil, but the devil wants to influence you. And the primary way they're going to do it is through other people, which includes music, the radio, television. The devil will whisper in your ear through those songs, and you got to replace those with new songs. That's why we're doing the musical psalms. We're, we're going to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I'll, I'll, I'm going to help you in any way I can. There's the, the Bible app, the uh, Faithful Word app that has music in there. We're burning CDs that will have songs you can put in your car so you can get it in your heart so it'll come back out of your mouth. So when you're, when you're having a bad day, you'll sing. God uses that as a tool. Look at Psalm 95, verse number 1. Oh, come. Let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. A rock, that's solid, right? We are saved. It's solid. It's done. Now have some true joy. Build on that rock. Build your house on that rock. Start putting some things in your heart that you can sing to the Lord. Every now and then I have to rock Naomi to sleep. She wants daddy. That's and nothing else will do. And look, I am, I am not musically talented. There are some of you in here that are. I, you know, I play the keyboard, right? It's called the, the, the computer keyboard. That's the musical instrument I can play. I am a computer nerd. I am musically retarded, okay? But I sing to her, and it's, I just make it up as I go, and I pray to God, and I thank God for that baby, and I thank God for the responsibility of having someone to lead. And if you probably heard me singing, you'd probably say, I sounded goofy, but I don't care. I, I'm joyful for the opportunity to sing to God and thank Him for my child. Look, look at verse number 2. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving, and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. What are the Psalms for? Praising God. Look, there's a lot of wisdom in Proverbs. We're going to be going through Proverbs here in, in the church. And we're going to have this music available. I want, as a church, I want us to get on fire for godly music. Look at verse number 6 in this chapter. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For He is our God, 
and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice. It starts today. Will you worship the Lord? Will you change your song today? Will you, will you get in the word today? Will you commit to reading the Bible today? And I, and I don't want you to forswear yourself. I don't want you to come bow down up here and say, oh Lord, I'll, I'll read every day. I don't want you to lie. Don't lie to God and say, I promise I'll always do it. Just, just do it. Just do it, yes. right? I've, I've had employees before and it was always the guy that said, I know how to do this and I know how to do that. And oh, I got all this. Okay, do it. Uh, hold on, let me look something up, right? It was the quiet guy that got his work done I knew I could trust in. Hey, I need something done. Okay. That's all he had to say. Well, have you ever done it before? When's the last time? I didn't, I didn't even, I, really, I know the guy. If he said, okay, he'll do it. That's the kind of Christian we ought to be. Not the guy boasting of, our, of some false gift. Oh, I can do this. I can do that. I'll be the guy. No, 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 no. Be quiet. Be confident in the Lord. He's given you the ability to just go and do what you know you got to do. Get to work. Get on fire. I mean, hey, we are a team. We got to help each other do this, and it starts with yourself. You got to lead yourself in the right direction. Look at verse 8. Again, he says it. Harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the days of temptation in the wilderness. Go to 1 Kings chapter 3 in the Old Testament. 1 Kings chapter 3. Again, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. How do I stay steadfast to the end? You decide today you're going to hear his voice. You obey what it says. It says to go to church. It says to change the song in your heart and have joy unto the Lord. Sing unto the Lord. Be thankful unto the Lord. Don't harden your heart. Don't let the world get you down. Look, in James 1, he says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, it shall be given. You say, hey, I need some wisdom. Hey, me too. God has promised you he'll give it to you. God wants you to be more wise now that you're saved. He wants to give you more gifts, more talents, more abilities, more ministry, more souls. But it starts with you. What do you have to do to get more wisdom? You have to ask. He says, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. What's he saying there in James 1? You don't have enough wisdom. You need to ask God for it. When you ask God, you need to ask with confidence that he will give it. Lord, I need some wisdom to remain steadfast to the end. He says, done. You've already got it. Lord, maybe one day, if you're not too busy, can you give me a little bit? I mean, I know I don't. I know you may not have the time. Hey, just, Lord, give it to me. You promised. Come boldly before his throne and say, Lord, I need some help. Lord, I'm trusting in you to provide. You've promised you're going to do it. You know I need these things to do what you've commanded me to do. What's the flip side of that coin? You harden your heart. Well, today, oh, I don't think he really means today. Well, I don't think he really means me. Well, I don't think he can fix my problem. I don't think the word of, of God is powerful enough to fix my problem. Don't harden your heart to the word of God. The solution is right there in it. He wants you to have more wisdom. And look, as a church, we're entering into our second year. And we're starting the book of Proverbs. I was going to do a gospel and, and after talking to a lot of different people, and I said, and then maybe we'll do Proverbs afterwards. Everybody I spoke to, they were like, cool, a gospel. Ooh, Proverbs afterwards. I'm like, okay, well, we're going to do Proverbs, you know. We as a church need Proverbs. Look, I as a man need Proverbs. As a dad, as a, as a father and a husband and everything else, I need Proverbs. I need that wisdom that God has for us. So as a church on Wednesday nights, we're going through the book of Proverbs. I want you to be here with me. I, I, we all need some wisdom. And he says if we ask in faith, he will provide it. My prayer that I'm asking in faith and confidence is, God, will you give all of us more wisdom as we study the book of Proverbs? But I need your help. I can't do it alone. I need you to commit in your heart that you want some wisdom from God. Where did, he, where did the wisdom of Proverbs come from? We're going to find out. Let's, we're in 1 Kings chapter 3. Look at verse number 9. Give therefore thy servant, this is Solomon speaking to God, give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this 
thy so great a people. Solomon saying, God, your people are the highest, right? Look, as a leader of this church, my prayer to God when I'm preaching, writing a sermon is, Lord, help me to help your people. It's your people that I'm here for. It's not for me to showboat over you or to lead over you. I'm supposed to be an example from among the flock. I'm right here with you fighting this fight. I am part of the team just as much as you, right? We are all sheep of that great shepherd. And guess what? Sheep beget sheep. Did you know a shepherd doesn't beget sheep? Think about this, right? I am a sheep of the great shepherd. I want to beget more sheep. I want my little ones to become sheep of God and follow God. I want you guys, as a leader, to lead as a sheep. Right? Think about that. Look what he says here. So Solomon, one of the greatest leaders, saying, Lord, how do I lead your people? I need understanding. He's saying, I don't have the wisdom to do it. I need you to give it to me. Look what God does here in verse 10. And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. You understand what just happened here? God is pleased. When he says in James to ask in faith, Lord, I need wisdom. He says, just ask in faith. Just believe it. So Solomon, out of a sincere heart, said, Lord, I need understanding. I need wisdom to lead your people, to lead my family, to lead, to lead the Christians in, around me, to, to, to help people. He says, just ask. It pleased the Lord. If you today in your heart say, Lord, I need more wisdom, and you mean it, that will please the Lord. And what's he going to do? Done. It's settled. You've already got it. Now apply it. Here it is. Get to work. Get to studying it. Look what he says. We're we'll start back over in 12. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. He says, you're going to be the most famous because you asked for understanding instead of riches, instead of the kingdom, instead of all those other things. I'll give you that stuff, but your heart will be better than everybody else. Look at verse 13. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. Hey, Christian, you want to have a, a nice, prosperous life and live to an old age and see your children raise up and serve God and go and do great things? Keep his commandments. Ask for wisdom. Believe he's going to give it. Now go to Proverbs chapter 1 and we're done. Proverbs chapter 1. This is where we're going to be starting on Wednesday night. Proverbs 1 is such a powerful book in and of itself. It's probably one of the most powerful Proverbs of all 31. And, you know, for 31 weeks, we're going to be studying Proverbs. And I want your help. I want you to commit to reading Proverbs every day for the next 31 weeks. Look, this is a big commitment. Don't come and tell, promise me you're going to do it. Just do it. Don't forswear yourself and say, God, I promise. Just do it. Just do it. If you're already reading your Bible, add this to it. If you're not reading your Bible, start with this. Every day, look at the calendar. Today's the second. Uh, if you haven't done it yet, go home today and read Proverbs 1 and 2 and catch up. And tomorrow morning, read chapter 3. And then 4 and 5. I want you to read Proverbs every day of the month. There's 31 Proverbs. There's 30, 31 days in the month. It's easy. Just look at the, you know, if you miss one, they only take a couple minutes each. But I want this church to grow spiritually in wisdom and understanding, and it will happen if we do this, if we do it God's way, if we search His Word. If you, if you guys commit to this, and I'm going to commit to trying to do it, I'm going to do the best that I can, because it pleases the Lord. I want His wisdom. We're going to study one chapter a week, but we're going to try to read one chapter a day. Will you guys help me with this? Look at Proverbs 1, verse number 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, 
Listen, a lot of Proverbs is going to be definitions, defining what that word is and how to get it, what it means. There is a very close relationship between these words here, wisdom, understanding, and instruction. They all kind of go hand in hand. Because it, it's like, if, I said, if you said, well, I don't know how to operate a computer, and I said, here you go, here's the manual. This is the knowledge that you need. This is the instruction manual. Oh, great. What are you going to do with it? Well, you don't have it until you open it. When you read it, then you can begin to understand it. Now, oh, I see what it means. I understand now. Then go do. Wisdom is when you enact the knowledge, the instruction, you have understanding, then you go do it, that's wisdom. It all goes hand in hand. Look at verse number three. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice and judgment and equity. How do we know when to judge righteous judgments? When we know what the Word of God says. When we judge our own thoughts and intents by the Word of God, when we let it be our standard, look at verse four. To give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Listen, a simple-minded person is usually over the top, and the Bible says it's time for you to become simple. Time to tone it down a little, right? You ever met somebody, they're, woo! You're like, hey, where's your volume? Can I just turn you down just a little? Right, listen, to the young man, he says, what's a young man need? Knowledge and discretion. There's a time to be discreet. It's not always, look at me, I'm the best. Hey, shut your mouth and learn something. Pay attention. Look, look what he says in verse 5. A wise man, see there's the goal. You start as a young man or a simple man, the goal is to become a wise man. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. So look, we start simple, we're going to grow, we're going to learn as a church as we study this out. One day God will look down and say, this guy is a wise man, this is a man of understanding, and you have attained unto wise counsels. Now there's two applications of that. Number one, when you go to make war, you need wise counsel, right? If we're going to make a big decision here as a congregation, I'm going to ask your opinion. I may not ask for your vote, but I'm going to ask your opinion. Hey brother, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? Just as much as I went around and asked everybody, what do you think? I'm thinking about preaching the book of Mark. And then Proverbs. And everybody said, ooh, Proverbs. Well, guess what? I attained unto wise counsel, and I see everybody wants to hear some Proverbs. Guess what we need as a church? Some understanding, some wisdom. So we're going to do Proverbs instead, right? To attain unto wise counsel means once you search the Word of God enough, you're the guy that people go to. Hey, brother so-and-so, I got a question for you. For me? Who am I? Well, now you're wise counsel because you said this is the standard. I'm going to listen to this, I'm going to obey this, I'm going to study it, whether I like it or not, I know what it says, and now you are a wise counselor to those in need. That's the goal of the book of Proverbs. Look at verse 6. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Dark does not mean evil, it means mysterious, it's covered, right? In other words, as you gain wisdom, you will be able to shed some light on a dark subject. You'll be able to, to reveal some understanding and, under, and make known to the simple. Make it simple. Make it easy. Make it easy to digest for people. Look at verse 7, last verse. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. How do we stay steadfast to the end? He says, today, harden not your heart. Right? Hear the voice obey the word, pay attention, God has a message for you, and here he says, fools despise wisdom and instruction. It's a fool that will harden their heart, they'll listen to the voice of a stranger instead of the voice of God. But we, as we get, get on fire for God, it's going to start with the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Step one, Christian, you need to be afraid of disobeying God. You need to be afraid of what will happen to your life if you refuse to open this up and make it your standard. God has given everything you need to be successful in the Christian life. It starts with the Bible. If you're willing to humble yourself and submit yourself to the Word of God, hey, one Proverbs a day, how about 15 minutes a day, get on fire, let's do an hour a day, whatever, whatever. Obey the Word, and then God will bless you greatly. And as a church, I want you to take this Proverbs challenge with me. 
I want you to be here on Wednesdays as we study every chapter, and I want you to open it up every day, and I want you to read every chapter throughout the month. So by the time that we're 31 weeks down the road, you would have read Proverbs 31 times. Like, you would have read it every month, rather. Every month. So what is that? How many months is that? Where's, where's my math nerds? No math nerds in here. Look, for the next half of a year, let's read Proverbs. Let's say, hey, I want to read Proverbs through and through for the next six months. I want to be here on Wednesday night and study it out. And I promise you, if you ask in faith, believing it will please the Lord, He will give you wisdom. And you will be steadfast to the end. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, thank you for this church. Lord, thank you for helping us through the first year. Lord, we trust you to get us through the second year. Lord, I pray that you would help us to grow spiritually in knowledge and understanding of your word. Lord, help us not to provoke you to anger by hardening our hearts. Lord, help us to be serious and take your promise today and apply your promise today and be steadfast to the end. Lord, we love you. I ask that you would bless our time of soul winning today. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Oh, cool. Song number 18. Take the name of